A Lodging for the Night by Robert Louis Stevenson It was late in November 1456. A snow fell over Paris with rigorous, relentless persistence. Sometimes the wind made a sally and scattered it in flying vortices. Sometimes there was a lull, and flake after flake descended out of the black night air, silent, circuitous, interminable. To poor people, looking up under moist eyebrows, it seemed a wonder where it all came from. Master Francis Villon had propounded an alternative that afternoon at a tavern window. Was it only pagan Jupiter plucking geese upon Olympus, or were the holy angels molting? He was only a poor master of arts, he went on, and as the question somewhat touched upon divinity, he does not venture to conclude. A silly old priest from Montagi, who was among the company, treated the young rascal to a bottle of wine in honour of the jest and the grimaces with which it was accompanied, and swore on his own white beard that he had been just such another irreverent dog when he was Villon's age. The air was raw and pointed, but not far below freezing, and the flakes were large, damp and adhesive. The whole city was sheeted up. An army might have marched from end to end, and not a footfall given the alarm. If there were any belated birds in heaven, they saw the island like a large white patch, and the bridges like slim white spars on the black ground of the river. High up overhead the snow settled among the tracery of the cathedral towers. Many a niche was drifted full, many a statue wore a long white bonnet on its grotesque or stainted head. The gargoyles had been transformed into great false noses, drooping toward the point. The crockets were like upright pillows swollen on one side. In the intervals of the wind there was a dull sound of dripping about the precincts of the church. The cemetery of St. John had taken its own share of the snow. All the graves were decently covered. Tall white housetops stood around in grave array. Worthy burghers were long ago in bed, benight-capped like their domiciles. There was no light in all the neighbourhood but a little peep from a lamp that hung swinging in the church door, and tossed the shadows to and fro in time to its oscillations. The clock was hard on ten when the patrol went by with halberds and a lantern, beating their hands, and they saw nothing suspicious about the cemetery of St. John. Yet there was a small house backed up against the cemetery wall which was still awake, and awake to evil purpose in that snoring district. There was not much to betray it from without, only a stream of warm vapour from the chimney-top, a patch where the snow melted on the roof, and a few half-obliterated footprints at the door. But within, behind the shuttered windows, Master Francis Villon, the poet, and some of the thievish crew with whom he consorted, were keeping the night alive and passing round the bottle. A great pile of living embers diffused a strong and ruddy glow from the arched chimney. Before this straddled Dom Nicholas, the Picardy monk, with his skirts picked up and his fat legs bared to the comfortable warmth. His dilated shadow cut the room in half, and the firelight only escaped on either side of his broad person and in a little pool between his outspread feet. His face had the beery, bruised appearance of the continual drinkers. It was covered with a network of congested veins, purple in ordinary circumstances, but now pale violet, for even with his back to the fire, the cold pinched him on the other side. His cowl had half fallen back and made a strange acrescence on either side of his bull neck. So he straddled, grumbling, and cut the room in half with the shadow of his portly frame. On the right, Villon and Guy Tabari were huddled together over a scrap of parchment, Villon making a ballad which he was to call the Ballad of Roast Fish, and Tabari spluttering admiration at his shoulder. The poet was a rag of a man, dark, little and lean, with hollow cheeks and thin black locks. He carried his four-and-twenty years with feverish animation. Greed had made folds about his eyes. Evil smiles had puckered his mouth. The wolf and pig struggled together in his face. It was an eloquent, sharp, ugly, earthly countenance. His hands were small and prehensile with fingers knotted like a cord, and they were continually flickering in front of him in violent and expressive pantomime. 
As for Tabari, a broad, complacent, admiring imbecility breathed from his squashed nose and slobbering lips. He had become a thief, just as he might have become the most decent of burgesses, by the imperious chance that rules the lives of human geese and human donkeys. At the monk's other hand, Montigny and Thevenin Ponset played a game of chance. About the first there clung some favour of good birth and training, as about a fallen angel, something long, lithe and courtly in the person, something aquiline and darkling in the face. Thevenin, poor soul, was in great feather. He had done a good stroke of knavery that afternoon in the Faubourg Saint-Jacques, and all night he had been gaining from Montigny. A flat smile illuminated his face. His bald head shone rosily in a garland of red curls. His little protuberant stomach shook with silent chucklings as he swept in his gains. "'Doubles or quits?' said Thevenin. Montigny nodded grimly. "'Some may prefer to dine in state,' wrote Villon, "'on bread and cheese on silver plate. "'Or, or, help me out, Guido,' Tabari giggled, "'or parsley on a silver dish,' scribbled the poet. "'The wind was freshening without. "'It drove the snow before it, "'and sometimes raised its voice in a victorious swoop "'and made sepulchral grumblings in the chimney. "'The cold was growing sharper as the night went on. Villon protruding his lips, imitated the gust with something between a whistle and a groan. It was an eerie, uncomfortable talent of the poets, much detested by the Picardy monk. "'Can't you hear it rattle in the gibbet?' said Villon. "'They are all dancing the devil's jig on nothing up there. You may dance, my gallants, but you'll be none the warmer. Whew, what a gust! Down went somebody just now. A meddler the fewer on the three-legged meddler tree.' "'I say, Dom Nicholas, it'll be cold to-night on the Saint-Denis road?' he asked. Dom Nicholas winked both his big eyes and seemed to choke upon his Adam's apple. Montfaucon, the great grisly Paris gibbet, stood hard by the Saint-Denis road, and the pleasantry touched him on the roar. As for Tabari, he laughed immoderately over the meddlers. He had never heard anything more light-hearted, and he held his sides and crowed. Villon fetched him a fillip on the nose, which turned his mirth into an attack of coughing. "'Oh, stop that now,' said Villon, "'and think of rhymes to fish.' "'Doubles or quits,' said Montigny doggedly. "'With all my heart,' quoth Thevenin. "'Is there any more in that bottle?' asked the monk. "'Open another,' said Villon. "'How do you ever hope to fill that big hogshead, your body, "'with little things like bottles? "'And how do you expect to get to heaven?' How many angels, do you fancy, can be spared to carry up a single monk from Picardy? Or do you think yourself another Elias, and they'll send the coach for you? Ominibus impossibile, replied the monk as he filled his glass. Tabari was in ecstasies. Villon filliped his nose again. Laugh at my jokes if you like, he said. He was very good, objected Tabari. Villon made a face at him. Think of rhymes to fish, he said. What have you to do with Latin? You'll wish you knew none of it at the great assizes when the devil calls for Guido Tabari, clericus, the devil with a humpback and red-hot fingernails. Talking of the devil, he added in a whisper, look at Montigny. All three peered covertly at the gamester. He did not seem to be enjoying his luck. His mouth was a little to a side. One nostril nearly shut and the other much inflated. The black dog was on his back, as people say, in terrifying nursery metaphor and he breathed hard under the gruesome burden. "'He looks as if he could knife him,' whispered Tabari, with round eyes. The monk shuddered, and turned his face and spread his open hands to the red embers. It was the cold that thus affected Dom Nicholas, and not any excess of moral sensibility. "'Come now,' said Villon, "'about this ballad. How does it run so far?' And beating time with his hand, he read it aloud to Tabari. They were interrupted at the fourth rhyme by a brief and fatal movement among the gamesters. The round was completed, and Thevenin was just opening his mouth to claim another victory, when Montigny leaped up, swift as an adder, and stabbed him to the heart. The blow took effect before he had time to utter a cry, before he had time to move. A tremor or two convulsed his frame, his hands opened and shut, his heels rattled on the floor. Then his head rolled backward over one shoulder, 
with the eyes open, and Thevenin and Ponset's spirit had returned to him who made it. Everyone sprang to his feet, but the business was over in two twos. The four living fellows looked at each other in rather a ghastly fashion, the dead man contemplating a corner of the roof with a singular and ugly leer. My God, said Tabari, and he began to pray in Latin. Villon broke out into hysterical laughter. He came a step forward and clucked a ridiculous bow at Thevenin and laughed still louder. Then he sat down suddenly, all of a heap, upon a stall and continued laughing bitterly as though he would shake himself to pieces. Montigny recovered his composure first. Let's see what he has about him, remarked, and he picked the dead man's pockets with a practised hand and divided the money into four equal portions on the table. There's for you, he said. The monk received his share with a deep sigh and a single stealthy glance at the dead Thevenin, who was beginning to sink into himself and topple sideways off the chair. We're all for it, cried Villon, swallowing his mirth. It's a hanging job for every man jack of us that's here, not to speak of those who aren't. He made a shocking gesture in the air with his raised right hand and put out his tongue and threw his head on one side so as to counterfeit the appearance of one who has been hanged. Then he pocketed his share of the spoil and executed a shuffle with his feet as if to restore the circulation. Tabari was the last to help himself. He made a dash at the money and retired to the other end of the apartment. Montigny stuck Thevenin upright in the chair and drew out the dagger which was followed by a jet of blood. You fellows had better be moving, he said, as he wiped the blade on his victim's doublet. I think we had, returned Villon with a gulp. Damn his fat head, he broke out. It sticks in my throat like phlegm. What right has a man to have red hair when he is dead? And he fell all of a heap again upon the stool, and fairly covered his face with his hands. Montigny and Don Nicholas laughed aloud, even to Barry feebly chiming in. Cry, baby, said the monk. I always said he was a woman, added Montigny with a sneer. Sit up, can't you? He went on giving another shake to the murdered body. Tread out that fire, Nick. But Nick was better employed. He was quietly taking Villon's purse as the poet sat, limp and trembling, on the stool where he had been making a ballad not three minutes before. Montigny and Tabari dumbly demanded a share of the booty, which the monk silently promised as he passed the little bag into the bosom of his gown. In many ways an artistic nature unfits a man for practical existence. No sooner had the theft been accomplished than Villon shook himself, jumped to his feet and began helping to scatter and extinguish the embers. Meanwhile, Montigny opened the door and cautiously peered into the street. The coast was clear. There was no meddlesome patrol in sight. Still, it was judged wiser to slip out severally, and as Villon was himself in a hurry to escape from the neighbourhood of the dead Thevenin, and the rest were in a still greater hurry to get rid of him before he should discover the loss of his money, he was the first by general consent to issue forth into the street. The wind had triumphed and swept all the clouds from heaven. Only a few vapours, as thin as moonlight, fleeted rapidly across the stars. It was bitter cold, and by a common optical effect things seemed almost more definite than in the broadest daylight. The sleeping city was absolutely still. A company of white hoods, a field full of little alps below the twinkling stars. Villon cursed his fortune. Would it were still snowing? Now, wherever he went, he left an indelible trail behind him on the glittering streets. Wherever he went, he was still tethered to the house by the cemetery of St. John. Wherever he went, he must weave, with his own plodding feet, the rope that bound him to the crime and would bind him to the gallows. The leer of the dead man came back to him with a new significance. He snapped his fingers as if to pluck up his own spirits, and choosing a street at random, stepped boldly forward in the snow. Two things preoccupied him as he went, the aspect of the gallows at Montfaucon, in this bright windy phase of the night's existence for one, and for another the look of the dead man, with his bald head and garland of red curls. Both struck cold upon his heart, and he kept quickening his pace, as if he could escape from unpleasant thoughts by mere fleetness of foot. Sometimes he looked back over his shoulder with a sudden nervous jerk, but he was the only moving thing in the white streets, except when the wind swooped round a corner and threw up the snow, which was beginning to freeze in spouts of glittering dust. 
Suddenly he saw, a long way before him, a black clump and a couple of lanterns. The clump was in motion, and the lanterns swung as though carried by men walking. It was a patrol, and though it was merely crossing his line of march, he judged it wiser to get out of eyeshot as speedily as he could. He was not in the humour to be challenged, and he was conscious of making a very conspicuous mark upon the snow. Just on his left hand there stood a great hotel, with some turrets and a large porch before the door. It was half ruinous, he remembered, and had long stood empty, and so he made three steps of it and jumped inside the shelter of the porch. It was pretty dark inside after the glimmer of the snowy streets, and he was groping forward with outspread hands when he stumbled over some substance which offered an indescribable mixture of resistances, hard and soft, firm and loose. His heart gave a leap, and he sprang two steps back and stared dreadfully at the obstacle. Then he gave a little laugh of relief. It was only a woman, and she dead. He knelt beside her to make sure upon this latter point. She was freezing cold and rigid like a stick. A little ragged finery fluttered in the wind about her hair, and her cheeks had been heavily rouged that same afternoon. Her pockets were quite empty, but in her stocking, underneath the garter, Villon found two of the small coins that went by the names of whites. It was little enough, but it was always something, and the poet was moved with a deep sense of pathos that she should have died before she had spent her money. That seemed to him a dark and pitiable mystery, and he looked from the coins in his hand to the dead woman and back again to the coins, shaking his head over the riddle of man's life. Henry V of England, dying at Vincennes just after he had conquered France, and this poor jade cut off by a cold draught in a great man's doorway, before she had time to spend her couple of whites. It seemed a cruel way to carry on the world. Two whites would have taken such a little while to swander, and yet it would have been one more good taste in the mouth, one more smack of the lips, before the devil got the soul, and the body was left to birds and vermin. He would like to use all his tallow before the light was blown out and the lantern broken. While these thoughts were passing through his mind, he was feeling half mechanically for his purse. Suddenly his heart stopped beating, a feeling of cold scales passed up the back of his legs, and a cold blow seemed to fall upon his scalp. He stood petrified for a moment, then he felt again with one feverish movement, and then his loss burst upon him and he was covered with perspiration. To spendthrifts money is so living and actual. It is such a thin veil between them and their pleasures. There is only one limit to their fortune, that of time, and a spendthrift with only a few crowns is the emperor of Rome until they are spent. For such a person to lose his money is to suffer the most shocking reverse and fall from heaven to hell, from all to nothing in a breath. And all the more he has to put his head in the halter for it. If he may be hanged tomorrow for that same purse, so dearly earned, so foolishly departed. Villon stood and cursed. He threw the two whites into the street and shook his fist at heaven. He stamped and was not horrified to find himself trampling the poor corpse. Then he began rapidly to retrace his steps toward the house beside the cemetery. He had forgotten all fear of the patrol, which was long gone by at any rate, and had no idea but that of his lost purse. It was in vain that he looked right and left upon the snow. Nothing was to be seen. He had not dropped it in the streets. Had it fallen in the house? He would have liked dearly to go in and see, but the idea of the grisly occupant unmanned him. And he saw besides, as he drew near, that their efforts to put out the fire had been unsuccessful. On the contrary, it had broken into a blaze, and a changeful light played in the chinks of the door and window, and revived his terror for the authorities and Paris gibbet. He returned to the hotel with the porch, and groped about upon the snow for the money he had thrown away in his childish passion, but he could only find one white. The other had probably stuck sideways and sunk deeply in. With a single white in his pocket, all his projects for a rousing night in some wild tavern vanished utterly away, and it was not only pleasure that fled laughing from his grasp. Positive discomfort, positive pain, attacked him as he stood ruefully before the porch. His perspiration had dried upon him, and though the wind had now fallen, a binding frost was setting in stronger with every hour, and he felt benumbed and sick at heart. What was to be done? Late as was the hour, improbable as was success, 
he would try the house of his adopted father, the chaplain of St. Benoit. He ran there all the way and knocked timidly. There was no answer. He knocked again and again, taking heart with every stroke, and at last steps were heard approaching from within. A barred wicket fell open in the iron-studded door and emitted a gush of yellow light. "'Hold up your face to the wicket,' said the chaplain from within. "'It's only me,' whimpered Villon. "'Oh, it's only you, is it?' returned the chaplain, and he cursed him with foul and priestly oaths for disturbing him at such an hour, and bade him to be off to hell where he came from. "'My hands are blue to the wrists,' pleaded Villon. "'My feet are dead and full of twinges. "'My nose aches with the sharp air. "'The cold lies in my heart. "'I may be dead before morning. "'Only this once, Father, and before God I will never ask again.' "'You should have come earlier,' said the ecclesiastic coolly. "'Young men require a lesson now and then.' "'He shut the wicket and retired deliberately into the interior of the house. "'Villon was beside himself.' He beat upon the door with his hands and feet and shouted hoarsely after the chaplain. "'Wormy old fox!' he cried. "'If I had my hand under your twist, "'I would send you flying headlong into the bottomless pit.' A door shut in the interior, faintly audible to the poet down long passages. He passed his hand over his mouth with an oath, and then the humour of the situation struck him, and he laughed and looked lightly up to heaven, where the stars seemed to be winking over his discomfiture. What was to be done? It looked very like a night in the frosty streets. The idea of the dead woman popped into his imagination and gave him a hearty fright. What had happened to her in the early night might very well happen to him before morning. And he so young, and with such immense possibilities of disorderly amusement before him. He felt quite pathetic over the notion of his own fate, as if it had been someone else's, and made a little imaginative vignette of the scene in the morning when they should find his body. He passed all his chances under review, turning the white between his thumb and forefinger. Unfortunately, he was on bad terms with some old friends who would once have taken pity on him in such a plight. He had lampooned them in verses, he had beaten and cheated them, and yet now, when he was so close to a pinch, he thought there was at least one who might perhaps relent. It was a chance, it was worth trying at least, and he would go and see. On the way two little accidents happened to him, which coloured his musings in a very different manner. For, first he fell in with the track of a patrol, and walked in it for some yards, although it lay out of his direction. And this spirited him up, at least he had confused his trail, for he was still possessed with the idea of people tracking him all about Paris over the snow, and collaring him next morning, before he was awake. The other matter affected him very differently. He passed a street corner where, not so long before, a woman and her child had been devoured by wolves. This was just the kind of weather, he reflected, when wolves might take it into their heads to enter Paris again, and a lone man in these deserted streets would run the chance of something worse than a mere scare. He stopped and looked upon the place with unpleasant interest. It was a centre where several lanes intersected each other, and he looked down them all one after another, and held his breath to listen, lest he should detect some galloping black things on the snow, or hear the sound of howling between him and the river. He remembered his mother telling him the story, and pointing out the spot, while he was yet a child. His mother, if he only knew where she lived, he might make sure, at least, of shelter. He determined he would inquire upon the morrow, Nay, he would go and see her, too, poor old girl. So thinking, he arrived at his destination, his last hope for the night. The house was quite dark like its neighbours, and yet after a few taps he heard a movement overhead, a door opening, and a cautious voice asking who was there. The poet named himself in a large whisper, and waited, not without some trepidation, the result. Nor had he to wait long, a window was suddenly opened, and a pail full of slops splashed down upon the doorstep. Villon had not been unprepared for something of the sort, and had put himself as much in shelter as the nature of the porch admitted. But for all that, he was deplorably drenched below the waist. His hose began to freeze almost at once. Death from cold and exposure stared him in the face. He remembered he was of physical tendency, and began coughing tentatively but the gravity of the danger steadied his nerves. 
He stopped a few hundred yards from the door where he had been so rudely used, and reflected with his finger to his nose. He could only see one way of getting a lodging, and that was to take it. He had noticed a house not far away, which looked as if it might be easily broken into, and thither he betook himself promptly, entertaining himself on the way with the idea of a room still hot, with a table still loaded with the remains of supper, where he might pass the rest of the black hours, and whence he should issue on the morrow with an armful of valuable plate, or even considered on what viands and what wines he should prefer. And as he was calling the roll of his favourite dainties, roast fish presented itself to his mind with an odd mixture of amusement and horror. I shall never finish that ballad, he thought to himself, and then, with another shudder at the recollection, Oh, damn his fat head, he repeated fervently, and spat on the snow. The house in question looked dark at first sight, but as Villon made a preliminary inspection in search of the handiest point of attack, a little twinkle of light caught his eye from behind a curtained window. The devil, he thought, people awake, some student or some saint, confound the crew. Can't they get drunk and lie in bed snoring like their neighbours? What's the good of curfew, and poor devils of bell-ringers jumping at a rope's end in bell-towers? What's the use of day if people sit up all night? The gripes to them, he grinned as he saw where his logic was leading him. Every man to his business, after all, added he, and if they're awake, by the Lord, I may come by a supper honestly for this once, and cheat the devil. He went boldly to the door, and knocked with an assured hand. On both previous occasions he had knocked timidly, and with some dread of attracting notice, but now, when he had just discarded the thought of a burglarious entry, knocking at a door seemed a mighty simple and innocent proceeding. The sound of his blows echoed through the house, with thin, phantasmal reverberations, as though it were quite empty, and these had scarcely died away before a measured tread drew nearer, a couple of bolts were withdrawn, and one wing was opened broadly, as though no guile or fear of guile were known to those within. A tall figure of a man, muscular and spare, but a little bent, confronted Villon. The head was massive in bulk, but finely sculptured, the nose blunt at the bottom, but refining upward to where it joined a pair of strong and honest eyebrows, the mouth and eyes surrounded with delicate markings, and the whole face based upon a thick white beard, boldly and squarely trimmed. Seen as it was by the light of a flickering hand-lamp, it looked perhaps nobler than it had a right to do, but it was a fine face, honourable rather than intelligent, strong, simple, and righteous. "'You knock late, sir,' said the old man, in resonant, courteous tones. Villon cringed, and brought up many servile wordings of apology. At a crisis of this sort, the beggar was uppermost in him, and the man of genius hid his head with confusion. "'You are cold,' repeated the old man, "'and hungry? Well, step in,' and he ordered him into the house with a noble enough gesture. "'Some great seigneur,' thought Villon, as his host, setting down the lamp on the flagged pavement of the entry, shot the bolts once more into their places. "'You will pardon me if I go in front,' he said, when this was done, and he preceded the poet upstairs into a large apartment, warmed with a pan of charcoal and lit by a great lamp hanging from the roof. It was very bare of furniture, only some gold plate on a sideboard, some folios, and a stand of armour between the windows. Some smart tapestry hung from the walls, representing the crucifixion of our Lord in one piece, and in another scene of shepherds and shepherdesses by a running stream. Over the chimney was a shield of arms. "'Will you seat yourself?' said the old man, "'and forgive me if I leave you. I am alone in my house to-night, and if you are to eat, I must forage for you myself.' No sooner was his host gone than Villon leaped from the chair on which he had just seated himself, and began examining the room with the stealth and passion of a cat. He weighed the gold flagons in his hand, opening all the folios, and investigated the arms upon the shield, and the stuff with which the seats were lined. He raised the window curtains, and saw that the windows were set with rich stained glass in figures, so far as he could see, of martial import. Then he stood in the middle of the room, drew a long breath, and retaining it with puffed cheeks, looked round and round him, turning on his heels, as if to impress every feature of the apartment on his memory. Seven pieces of plate, he said. If there had been ten, I would have risked it. A fine house and a fine old master, so help me all the saints. 
and just then, hearing the old man's tread returning along the corridor, he stole back to his chair and began toasting his wet legs before the charcoal pan. His entertainer had a plate of meat in one hand and a jug of wine in the other. He set down the plate upon the table, motioning Villon to draw in his chair, and going to the sideboard, brought back two goblets, which he filled. "'I drink to your better fortune,' he said, gravely touching Villon's cup with his own. "'To our better acquaintance,' said the poet, growing bold. "'A mere man of the people would have been awed by the courtesy of the old seigneur. "'But Villon was hardened in that matter. "'He had made mirth for great lords before now, "'and found them as black rascals as himself. "'And so he devoted himself to the Villons with a ravenous gusto, "'while the old man, leaning backward, watched him with steady, curious eyes. "'You have blood on your shoulder, my man,' he said. "'Montigny must have laid his wet right hand upon him as he left the house. "'He cursed Montigny in his heart. "'It was none of my shedding,' he stammered. "'I had not supposed so,' returned his host quietly. "'A brawl?' "'Well, something of that sort,' Villon admitted with a quaver. "'Perhaps a fellow murdered?' "'Oh, no, not murdered,' said the poet, more and more confused. "'It was all fair play, murdered by accident. "'I had no hand in it. God strike me dead,' he added fervently. "'One rogue the fewer, I dare say,' observed the master of the house. "'You may dare to say that,' agreed Villon, infinitely relieved. "'As big a rogue as there is between here and Jerusalem. "'He turned up his toes like a lamb, but it was a nasty thing to look at. "'I dare say you've seen dead men in your time, my lord,' he added, glancing at the armour. Many, said the old man. I have followed the wars, as you imagine. Villon laid down his knife and fork, which he had just taken up again. Were any of them bold? he asked. Oh, yes, and with hair as white as mine. I don't think I would mind the white so much, said Villon. His was red, and he had a return of his shuddering and tendency to laughter, which he drowned with a great draught of wine. "'I'm a little put out when I think of it,' he went on. "'I knew him, damn him, and the cold gives a man fancies, "'or the fancies give a man cold. I don't know which.' "'Have you any money?' asked the old man. "'I have one white,' returned the poet, laughing. "'I got it out of a dead jade stocking in a porch. "'She was as dead as Caesar, poor wench, and as cold as a church, "'with bits of ribbon sticking in her hair. "'This is a hard world in winter for wolves and wenches and poor rogues like me.' I, said the old man, Engourant de la Fouillée, Seigneur de Brise too, Bailly du Patatrac. Who and what may you be? Villon rose and made a suitable reverence. I am called Francis Villon, he said, a poor master of arts of this university. I know some Latin and a deal of vice. I can make chansons, ballads, lays, virelays, and roundels. And I am very fond of wine. I was born in a garret, and I shall not improbably die upon the gallows. I may add, my lord, that from this night forward I am your lordship's very obsequious servant to command. No servant of mine, said the knight, my guest for this evening and no more. A very grateful guest, said Villon politely, and he drank in dumb show to his entertainer. You are shrewd, began the old man, tapping his forehead, very shrewd. You have learning, you are a clerk and yet you take a small piece of money off a dead woman in the street. Is it not a kind of theft? It is a kind of theft much practised in the wars, my lord. The wars are the field of honour, returned the old man proudly. There a man plays his life upon the cast. He fights in the name of his lord the king, his lord God, and all their lordships, the holy saints and angels. Put it, said Villon, that I were really a thief. Should I not play my life also, and against heavier odds? "'For gain, and not for honour. Gain, repeated Villon with a shrug. "'Gain, the poor fellow wants supper and takes it. "'So does the soldier in a campaign. "'Why, what are all these requisitions we hear so much about? "'If they are not gain to those who take them, "'they are loss enough to others. "'The men at arms drink by a good fire, "'while the burgher bites his nails to buy them wine and wood. "'I have seen a good many ploughmen swinging on trees about the country. "'I... I have seen thirty on one elm, and a very poor figure they made, and when I asked someone how all these came to be hanged, I was told it was because they could not scrape together enough crowns to satisfy the men-at-arms. These things are a necessity of war, which the low-born must endure with constancy. 
It is true that some captains drive over hard. There are spirits in every rank not easily moved by pity, and indeed many follow arms who are no better than brigands. You see, said the poet, you cannot separate the soldier from the brigand, and what is a thief but an isolated brigand with circumspect manners? I steal a couple of mutton chops without so much as disturbing the farmer's sheep. The farmer grumbles a bit, but sups none the less wholesomely on what remains. You come up blowing gloriously on a trumpet, take away the whole sheep and beat the farmer pitifully into the bargain. I have no trumpet. I am only Tom, Dick or Harry. I am a rogue and a dog, and hanging's too good for me, with all my heart. But just you ask the farmer which of us he prefers. Just find out which of us he lies awake to curse on cold nights. Look at us two, said his lordship. I am old, strong and honoured. If I were turned from my house to-morrow, hundreds would be proud to shelter me. Poor people would go out and pass the night in the streets with their children, if I merely hinted that I wished to be alone. And I find you up, wandering homeless, and picking farthings off dead women by the wayside. I fear no man has nothing. I have seen you tremble and lose countenance at a word. I wake God's summons contentedly in my own house, or, if it please the king to call me out again, upon the field of battle. You look for the gallows, a rough, swift death, without hope or honour. Is there no difference between these two? As far as to the moon, Villon acquiesced. But if I had been born Lord of Brestoux, and you had been the poor scholar Francis, would the difference have been any the less? Should not I have been warming my knees at this charcoal pan, and would not you have been groping for farthings in the snow? Should not I have been the soldier, and you the thief? A thief? cried the old man. I a thief? If you understood your words, you would repent them. Villon turned out his hands with a gesture of inimitable impudence. If your lordship had done me the honour to follow my argument, he said. I do you too much honour in submitting to your presence, said the knight. Learn to curb your tongue when you speak with old and honourable men, or someone hastier than I may reprove you in a sharper fashion. And he rose and paced the lower end of the apartment, struggling with anger and antipathy. Villon surreptitiously refilled his cup and settled himself more comfortably in the chair, crossing his knees and leaning his head upon one hand and the elbow against the back of the chair. He was now replete and warm, and he was in no wise frightened of his host, having engaged him as justly as was possible between two such different characters. The night was far spent, and in a very comfortable fashion after all, and he felt morally certain of a safe departure on the morrow. "'Tell me one thing,' said the old man, pausing in his walk. "'Are you really a thief?' "'I claim the sacred rights of hospitality,' returned the poet. "'My lord, I am.' "'You are very young,' the knight continued. "'I should never have been so old,' replied Villon, showing his fingers, "'if I had not helped myself with these ten talents. "'They have been my nursing mothers and my nursing fathers. "'You may still repent and change.' "'I repent daily,' said the poet. "'There are few people more given to repentance than poor Francis. "'As for change, let somebody change my circumstances. "'A man must continue to eat,' if it were only that he may continue to repent. "'The change must begin in the heart,' returned the old man solemnly. "'My dear lord,' answered Villon, "'do you really fancy that I steal for pleasure? "'I hate stealing like any other piece of work or danger. "'My teeth chatter when I see a gallows. "'But I must eat, I must drink, "'I must mix in society of some sort. "'What the devil! "'Man is not a solitary animal. "'Cui Deus foe minan tradit.' Make me the king's pantler, make me abbot of Saint Denis, make me bailly of the patatrap, and then I shall be changed indeed. But as long as you leave me, the poor scholar Francis Villon, without a farthing, why, of course, I remain the same. The grace of God is all powerful. I should be a heretic to question it, said Francis. It has made you Lord of Breeze too, and bailly of the patatrap. It has given me nothing but the quick wits under my hat and these ten toes upon my hands. May I help myself to wine? I thank you respectfully. By God's grace, you have a very superior vintage. The Lord of Brestu walked to and fro with his hands behind his back. Perhaps he was not yet quite settled in his mind about the parallel between thieves and soldiers. 
Perhaps Villon had interested him by some cross thread of sympathy. Perhaps his wits were simply muddled by so much unfamiliar reasoning. But whatever the cause, he sometimes yearned to convert the young man to a better way of thinking, and could not make up his mind to drive him forth again into the street. There is something more than I can understand in this, he said at length. Your mouth is full of subtleties, and the devil has led you very far astray. But the devil is only a very weak spirit before God's truth, and all his subtleties vanish at a word of true honour, like darkness at morning. Listen to me once more. I learned long ago that a gentleman should live chivalrously and lovingly to God, and the king, and his lady, and though I have seen many strange things done, I have still striven to command my ways upon that rule. It is not only written in all noble histories, but in every man's heart, if he will take care to read. You speak of food and wine, and I know very well that hunger is a difficult trial to endure, but you do not speak of other wants, you say nothing of honour, of faith to God and other men, of courtesy, of love without reproach. It may be that I am not very wise, and yet I think I am. But you seem to me like one who has lost his way and made a great error in life. You are attending to the little wants, and you have totally forgotten the great and the only real ones, like a man who should be doctoring a toothache on the judgment day. For such things as honour and love and faith are not only nobler than food and drink, but indeed I think that we desire them more and suffer more sharply for their absence. I speak to you as I think you will most easily understand me. Are you not, while careful to fill your belly, disregarding another appetite in your heart, which spoils the pleasure of your life and keeps you continually wretched? Villon was sensibly nettled under all this sermonizing. You think I have no sense of honour, cried he. I'm poor enough, God knows. It's hard to see rich people with their gloves, and you blowing your hands. An empty belly is a bitter thing, although you speak so lightly of it. If you had had as many as I, perhaps you would change your tune. Anyway, I'm a thief, make the most of that, but I'm not a devil from hell. God strike me dead. I would have you know I've an honour of my own, as good as yours, though I don't prate about it all day long, as if it were a God's miracle to have any. It seems quite natural to me. I keep it in its box till it's wanted. Why now, look you here, how long have I been in this room with you? Did you not tell me you were alone in the house? Look at your gold plate. You're strong if you like, but you're old and unarmed, and I have my knife. What did I want but a jerk of the elbow? And here would have been you with the cold steel in your bowels, and there would have been me linking in the street with an armful of gold cups. Did you suppose I hadn't wit enough to see that? And I scorned the action. There are your damned goblets, as safe as in a church. There are you with your heart ticking as good as new, and here am I, ready to go out again as poor as I came in, with my one white that you threw in my teeth. And you think I have no sense of honour, God strike me dead. The old man stretched out his right arm. I will tell you what you are, he said. You are a rogue, my man, an impudent and black-hearted rogue and vagabond. I have passed an hour with you. Oh, believe me, I feel myself disgraced. And you have eaten and drank at my table. But now I am sick at your presence, and the day has come, and the night bird should be off to his roost. Will you go before or after? Which you please, returned the poet, rising. I believe you to be strictly honourable. He thoughtfully emptied his cup. I wish I could add you were intelligent, he went on, knocking on his head with his knuckles. Age, age, the brain stiff and rheumatic. The old man preceded him from a point of self-respect. Villon followed, whistling with his thumbs in his girdle. God pity you, said the lord of Brice too at the door. Good-bye, papa, returned Villon with a yawn. Many thanks for the cold mutton. The door closed behind him. The dawn was breaking over the white roofs. A chill, uncomfortable morning ushered in the day. Villon stood and heartily stretched himself in the middle of the road. A very dull old gentleman, he thought. I wonder what his goblets may be worth. End of A Lodging for the Night by Robert Louis Stevenson Recording by Lynn Thompson